Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. I'm joined once again by Kai Whiting. Kai, welcome to the podcast. And would you let us know what all has gone on in your world since we last talked? Hi, Steve. It's great to be here. And yes, I really should because I can't remember the last time I was on the podcast. It's been a lot has been happening. I think we haven't spoke much because of the COVID issue. It's been a bit. Yeah, it's been a bit. So yeah, I've, I've officially finished the PhD now. So that's Are nice. you Dr. Whiting now? I am, but I tell everybody that Kai is sufficient okay. and that I, I don't need to be referred to as a doctor because I feel like a medical doctor and I feel like someone's going to have a heart attack and be like, doctor, and I'll be like, <laughs> I can't, can't help you, I'm afraid. And I'm now working for UC Levan uh, in Belgium. So, ah. um, unfortunately, I'm still stuck here because of the situation with COVID and the lack of certainty. We, were, we here in Lisbon were in the red for quite a bit. And then Belgium was red and then we were free, but then we became like in the red zone and we, you know, movement was restricted. So it's a very uh, unusual situation. Quite unfortunate, really, because it would have been nice to be able to, to get there. But I have been learning some French so that when I do arrive, <laughs> I can speak to somebody. But it was very unusual to have to do like French lessons whilst in Portugal. It was really a, really a weird situation. Are you doing live, like interacting with someone uh on online to learn french or are you using programs or what's your so thing? yeah i have a, a teacher who uh she's based in france and we basically i wanted to i like to learn languages like a, a child would so i've asked her just to focus on sound because people often say like oh you can as an adult you can never sound native and that's not true it's just absolutely not true we just don't teach adults or we don't focus on sounds. We focus on meaning. We focus on increasing vocabulary. So I spent like the last six weeks just repeating sounds. Like I've been reading Harry Potter because it's easy to get hold of in any language, more or less. And then just saying correct it when I say it wrong. Hmm. So if you imagine a lot of kids say the word, or well, in the UK we have like they say logger, and you say yogurt, and they say logger, and you say yogurt until they get it right. And you wouldn't let your two-year-old walk around saying logger because you'd know they'd have a problem at school eventually. So the idea is that you'd correct them until they say it. And then you don't remember that as a kid doing that process, and you certainly do as a parent, but you don't remember as a kid. So the idea is to basically be very focused on sounds and if I say it correctly. So that way you do actually get a native um, speaker voice because you've got, you don't know, you, you have not attached any meaning. You're just attaching sound to, to uh, letters basically, or sets of letters so it's been like six weeks of just like repetition 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 every day but she said i'm starting to remove my english accent which is great oh. or my spanish accent because that comes through as well oh, so wow. it's been entertaining but completely surprising to me and very it's much harder to learn a language online than i thought it was so you have a paper out and you have another project that we want to talk about that I, I didn't even know existed until moments ago. Um, so first of all, there's a paper, How Might a Stoic Eat in Accordance with Nature and Environmental Facts? And then there's another project, which will you can announce we'll now to. or we can wait till till. We can after. wait, I think. We can wait, yeah. Okay. So I what I wanted to ask you, actually, was when you read the paper, were you surprised by the findings? Did you think I was going to come up with some other reason as to what we should do when thinking about eating? Because let me just clarify that it doesn't tell you exactly what you should do, exactly what you should eat. So I'll never tell you you should eat two sausages, chips and beans, for example, because that's not how stoicism works. It always will be, it depends, right? But within the it depends, Steve, were you surprised by what I said or what came to, to your mind when you read it? What did you find interesting? Um, I, I, what I found interesting was, I don't know if I was surprised by it, but uh, perhaps I missed some of, of, of the point, but uh, I think I, I think I grasped, grasped, I can't even say it, grasped it fairly well, um, was, was the contingency of stoicism uh, came through in your, in your analysis in that there is no universal answer to what to do it, it is all dependent on your situation and where you are and and um the best the best choices that are available to you 
depending on your location and how food gets to your location and what food's available at your location. And so stoicism never has easy answers. And, uh, and uh, I think, I think it comes through, but the one thing I, I want to know is wh why do Stoics hate condiments so much? <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> like, like, like Seneca would say, why are you putting ketchup on that? Like, if you're hungry enough, you won't need ketchup on that. Uh, actually, Musonius Rufus is probably the one who would say that. But uh... because ketchup was a re actually was garum, wasn't it? It was the fish sauce that was the equivalent. I'm of sure that yeah, they had like fermented fish sauce of some they type. Did. Yeah, and it was very unusual because you they would import it, even though they could get it locally. They some of them would have like favorite fish sauce from say Spain. Uh, even let's say Seneca had gone over to Italy. He would then really want to eat that garum sauce uh, from his own homeland. So he would probably import it in. And that's quite common. It was very strange because we'd always think that you want the local one because it's cheaper. But the Romans were a lot in the cities, or in the, particularly port cities, they were much richer than we ever imagined. Now we're only understanding that now because we've got analysis of what they people ate based on their co uh, collagen. So we know that some people who were wealthy were actually vegetarian which comes back into like Seneca's view of being vegetarian due to philosophical or uh, quasi-religious reasons. So it wasn't just a Seneca being fussy thing. Yeah, what do we know? Uh, so getting into the diet then, uh, do we know what Romans were eating then? Uh, are we analyzing their isotopes or how are we figuring that out? So I'm not an expert on the analysis, but I do know this. As a, it, they do look at basically the collagen analysis. They can tell you what kind of protein you ate. Uh, okay. so they can tell you what was it meat, was it fish, or was it uh, um, vegetable-based protein. But also Herculaneum, uh, which was some people don't know, but that was actually just as effective or more effective than Pompeii. It has a sewer. And so they actually know from the excrement. And I do have spoken to the archaeologist responsible for going through that um excrement let's say that uh what they ate so they they kind of liked a lot of sea urchins because they've seen a lot of sea urchin spikes that was quite a delicacy in herculaneum and actually when they did the analysis her people from herculaneum have a wide had a wider variety of um foods or chose to eat a wide variety of foods the middle class that is than present day people from napoli hmm. so the same kind of people but yet they actually had a richer diet uh, back in the Roman period for the middle class and wealthy, which surprises me somewhat because they've obviously they've still got the Bay of Naples. That hasn't changed. But I think food in the Roman period was very, very important. So it kind of tells you your priorities. Hmm. So they did have this humongous array, uh, you know, array of foods, which I, I was impressed with. You know, Napoli did seem to have, Napoli did seem to, for me at least, to have. Uh, wide variety, but to have Herculaneum have even more was quite surprising. Although one must, must realize that Herculaneum and Pompeii were very wealthy just before the, the Mount Vesuvius eruption. So they're not necessarily typical to the urban areas of the Roman Empire. But it does show that we've underestimated certainly the quality of life in terms of food. And the average person Herculaneum was like five foot. Um, I think it was like five foot five. So, and if you wanted to be a soldier, like not the necessarily the most elite, but you have to be five foot seven. Sorry, guys, if you're in meters, but five foot seven is quite. So, if you think in the Victorian period, people were, well, I remember this because Jack the Ripper murdered someone who was five foot one and they called her Tall Annie. So, five foot one, if you think, well, the average soldier, you know, not the elite soldier, the average soldier in, in the Roman Empire was five foot seven. Sorry, the, the, the limit, the, slim, uh, the smallest they could be was five to seven. That gives you some indication of how well they would have eaten. And obviously, a lot of people ate really badly. But then I would still say that in the US, based on uh, discussions and analysis, there are some people in the US that eat, unfortunately, very, very badly indeed and not through choice. So we have this sort of, we have this sort of forced belief that we've somehow improved over time that we're now now we're vegetarian because we believe it's like the right thing to do. You have a lot of that in sort of Europe, but it was already the case. In the Roman period. I um, wonder if yeah. um, mechanization of uh, agriculture has something to do with variety that, that, uh, and the availability of some variety because uh, for mechanization to work you have to have fields of plants that are the same that that are all maturing at the same time at the same height and and so we rely on that a lot uh, these days to for massive quantities of food, but not a lot of variety, perhaps. 
I think you actually hit the nail on the head. I've never really thought of it like that, but that's certainly true. Uh, people say, oh, we've got more variety than ever. But no, because very, you know, for example, Tyson Foods controls all the chicken products. So if you've got a very select few of people whose main interest is not your nutritional well-being, mm -hmm. they will just maximize yield and maximize profit. Whereas if you imagine if in the Roman period, if you didn't, didn't have that kind of economies of scale and they didn't work on the same economy, it was much more about delicacies and showing off, I guess. You right. could definitely say showing off was very important to you, uh, Cicero, uh, you know, playing the role as if he was somehow on a play, which appetizers was just like, oh, well, it's not about that. You should play the role because it's the right thing to do because you're, you know, it's God given. Cicero was more like, no, you're on a stage. So a lot of the Roman was about being on a stage and Seneca acts as people on the stage all the time. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right that there was the benefit in the Roman period was to create delicacies that people would want and to get reputation. And now it's not about necessarily reputation. In fact, the leaders of uh, Tyson Foods say the best thing to do is for them to be silent. But they don't want you to know that they are like responsible for 90 percent of non-halal chicken. Right? They're just not going to tell you that, which gives you some indication of the quality of the chicken. But, I, believe, uh, yes. I believe Tyson is a major employer here in the state where I reside, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And they, but they're not very loud about it. For the amount of money that gets processed through their hands, they're just not loud about it. And there's and, not a, just thinking about chicken, there's not a lot of diversity. And if you go back a few hundred years, we have all these heritage breeds of animals, even like, let's just assume we're going to eat animals for a moment. You, there was a lot of variety in your options and animals that were, adapted to living in different climates and so on and so forth and i'm sure plants had you know grains and other things there, there was more variety perhaps uh, when, when things were harvested by hand than when harvested mechanically now if we say that though, that, that will upset the paleo eaters that are eating chicken saying i'm eating what my ancestors eat and because <laughs> obviously that's not the case and if you go to africa they find it very strange that we eat very soft chicken as we eat very baby chickens. They tend to eat chicken that's two to three, three years old, and it's very tough. I don't know if you've ever eaten African chicken, but I cooked it with a Nigerian friend of mine, took a bite, and the flesh did not move. And so I literally was biting it, and it just didn't come off the bone. This is back when I ate meat. And my Nigerian friend, the next day, he came up to me, and he was very happy. I said, what happened? Conley, and he said, I beat the chicken. I mean, he managed to eat it. <laughs> so it's like unbelievable. And uh, all the Nigerians are like, I don't get your chicken in this country is terrible. It has no taste. You know, it's it just it's just nothing. It's not even got any muscle to it. And that's the point. There was no muscle on the on the bird. It's just sort of fat and uh, feeling a bit sorry for itself. So yeah, there is. The, I think you're absolutely right that there's there's definitely evidence that eggs and chickens and and uh, lamb and Cattle were certainly there was much more diversity back then. So we have a lot of diversity, a lot of diversity in ancient Rome. So that means there's choices, and where there's choices, there's a chance for stoicism, right? Um, <laughs> so what was the what, what do you think the Stoics got right about their their ideas of food choices? Let's just talk about the ancient world for a moment. What what did they have right, and what did they have wrong? I think in the action world, I can't really think of anything they had wrong because the, the main issue the, that we highlight is the way that we produce food in the contemporary period. Mm -hmm. So I won't say modern because modern's actually quite different because modern's actually a big range. But you know, in terms of the 21st, 20th and 21st century post-war world wars, the way that we can find animals is certainly against their nature. And I'm, you know, if you think about um, you know, veal how we staple the calf to the floor and then take its blood out drop by drop. I can't see anything less living less according to nature than that. So I think, I, I think that's the key thing here. So it's not exactly what, justice isn't only in what one eats, but also how one prepares and right. how one considers the animal. So I don't think, you know, like Cato talks a lot about, uh, sorry, Cato Cicero, I think has an analysis on what kind of foods that we should eat and Cato was very strict about being in his garden and what he liked to do um, when he was there so I, I think the key thing is would they view like I don't know if you've seen this pictures of cows with a hole in their side so you can check in Switzerland so you can check the start oh, I've heard of these things yes yeah, so I've not yeah, seen it myself but yeah the picture well the picture was enough for me I, I just can't see the strikes in that you know ancient strikes going that's natural and that's good not that because it's natural, it's good, right? I mean, good in the sense of that's just, that's self-controlled, that's wise. I don't right. mean good as in like, 
it's wonderful because it's natural, you know. Right, right, right. So um, I, I couldn't really see anything wrong with the ancient world unless it was excessive cruelty. And I think they had cruelty, but it was more like games they would play with the animals. So I would assume that You're right. putting, a, putting a lion to fight a Christian would be unfair on both both parts, right? And I think their their teleology was a little funny uh, with some of the Stoics, like you mentioned in the article that we've talked about this before, about the, the pig having life as a form of preservative. You know, those sort of ideas were a little, yeah. a little off, yeah. I'd say. So I wouldn't be, for me, that wouldn't be a question. And so let me clarify, because you asked me about what they ate. That would be more like, what's their attitude about the animal? Right, so their rather attitude. Rather than what sure, they ate. Sure. So, because I didn't think they got anything wrong with what they ate. Okay. Say. It was more like the way that they view animals. So I think that was the question you asked, okay. you were trying okay. to ask me. That's fine, yeah. That's so yeah, the way they view, viewed animals, um, and it makes sense in a way that there's this huge gap, or it seems to be a huge gap between the rationality of a human homo sapien and the next animal, I would argue land animal, because uh, now we're aware that whales and dolphins are very intelligent, but it was only in the 1970s when we recorded the equivalent of what we would now call sound, which is more like vibration. Um, until that point, we actually had a whale in margarine. So up until the early 70s, because we thought whales were silent, if you think of Moby Dick, you know, the silent killer, we had no respect for it. And then once it was recorded, the coders, the clicking sounds, we thought that was amazing. And we even put it on a rocket, you know, to say that if aliens came, they would hear whales. But that's just like a change of attitude, like the ability to record the communication of whales made us completely change our mind on their intelligence before we didn't think they were intelligent at all. So you think in the Roman period, they might not even, they would not have been aware of these very deep diving animals. Mm -hmm. So they were probably looking at, you know, the most intelligent, even perhaps a chimpanzee, which is not anywhere near as intelligent as a dolphin or, a, or an orca, that we call the things like killer whale, for example. And we use words like, I don't know if you know, there's a whale called the right whale, and it's called the right as in, it was the right whale for them because it was the easiest to kill. Yeah. And we still call that whale a, a right whale. And so it's kind of like the way that we communicate things is the way we perceive things. And then we become, we, we misjudge. Our impression is incorrect. So I certainly believe, particularly the pig, which is a very intelligent animal, that there was some prejudice towards that animal for, for certain reasons of how it walks around and eats and does things. So yes, I think the prejudice was there. There was definitely some understanding on Chorus of power, but Cleanthes didn't have that view and they argued about it, about the uh, rationality of ants and the uh, well, bees and other animals. And I think that that's what, that was incorrect. So how, why does that relate now to now? Because I would say that if we recognize that there's sentiments, and I would argue quite strongly based on the Neanderthal that we discussed before, intelligence, then the way that we treat animals should change. So a lot of people have made the argument, but it tastes so good and I really like it. But I don't know if you, have you ever heard that? Oh when yeah. You discussed it? Okay. And then I make the argument, okay, so if I wanted to have, you know, a certain relationship with an animal and you didn't think that was appropriate, um, <laughs> based on what I did with that animal, let's say, and I turn around and said, but I like it, would that be a reasonable excuse to continue to act in that way with the animal? And I'm, I'm saying it the way I am in case there are people younger people listening but if I, I if i behaved in that way and then and you said to me oh i don't like the way you do that with your you know your animal um i think just because it's your pet doesn't mean you should have that kind of right over that animal and i said to you but well, i like it i enjoy it you think i was weird and we probably wouldn't stay friends for very long right but if i put that that same animal on my plate we just shrug our shoulders and that that's the that's the irony because you say one, you kill the animal. The other one, arguably, it, they don't really suffer, depending on exactly what you do. But arguably, they may not well suffer. Yet one is highly seen as bad, terrible, appalling. And the other, which involves murder and mass <laughs> incarceration of animals, you, you could say it like that, that's absolutely fine, legally even, in the US. And so I found that really sort of mind-blowing that we have these double standards based on our values. And you have to say, well, why is that? Why is it we're entitled to treat the animal like this? But if I do, if I treat the animal in a different way that's not going to cause them, certainly not going to kill them, why is that so atrocious? So I think that's, you know, 
that's the question I started to think about going beyond what we should eat is how we should treat animals. And I think the Stoics certainly need to update how they see animals. Um, but that's going a little bit back into the Neanderthal paper. I don't know if that if we want to go well, back there. Let, or let's not. define something real fast that's in your title that I think comes to play as to how we where we start our conversation or how we figure this out. And that's the idea of living according to nature slash according to the facts, right? This yeah. is an idea that comes up several times in, in your work and you're drawing on others here as well. But could you describe the 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 difference or how those two living according to nature and living according to the facts, what those are and how they may be seen as similar or different? What an excellent question. I couldn't ask a question better myself in that way. Well, it depends on the on your position. So there's, in case you're new to stoicism, there's actually like two main theological caps. So one is what we would call, quote unquote, traditional stoics. And the other one would we call modern stoics. And generally, uh, we've called everybody um, who's stoic today, or at least says they practice stoicism today, modern stoics. And I actually think that's incorrect. We should call them contemporary stoics to distinguish between the, the theological position. So there's one, so let's say you tell there's two camps in the contemporary stoicism. In ancient stoicism, there really was only one camp. Even Marcus Aurelius, who says sometimes, is it providence or atoms, really was in the, I would call the stoic god, traditional stoic camp. So the traditional stoic, stoics tend to take majority of what the ancient stoics believed in terms of the, of the cosmology and the theology, as that still remains true. And they'll say things like, yes, I agree that, the, that God is benevolent, that there is providence, and that God is worthy of respect and reverence. And the way that a Stoic would achieve that is to observe nature, so literally be out in the world and observe what's going on, and try to align themselves with how they see the world. So God, in that sense, becomes a yardstick of good. So if, if you're a traditional Stoic and you see a cow being separated from its calf, you would start to say, oh, that's not letting the calf live according to nature. That's actually destroying the, I never say this word right, perhaps the, the okiosis. So the ability for appropriation, so the calf follows its mother. We're actually separating that. We're actually reducing that, uh, that bond or cutting it completely. That's completely wrong because that's against our yardstick, which is God. And so they would feel very uncomfortable about that. There's another group of people, which I call modern Stoics, who say, we don't have providence. The universe is completely random, uh, but we have sets of facts and we can derive what we ought to do from those facts, which I know people can jump up and down because the, the is to, art conundrum and all of that. The is right? art conundrum. So, yes, because the traditional folks don't have the is or conundrum because they say, well, I believe that the best thing to do is to live virtuously and progress towards eudaimonia. And if you don't agree with me, then we have nothing to talk about because you don't accept my premise. So that's their premise. And if you don't, if you say, well, I think the, I think that a purpose of humankind is not to live according to nature. I think it is to eat as much chocolate biscuits as possible. Then they'd say, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, like there's nothing, there's, there's nothing to talk about. That that is, they don't have the issue with saying, yeah, that that is what is good, and that's what I'm going for. Um, Lawrence Becker, who was an, was a scholar, who tried to develop his. He wouldn't say his own version, but certainly a modern interpretation or contemporary interpretation of what the ancient Stoic world would have done if it had quote, unquote, evolved and continued to today. And he makes the case that environmental facts is living according to nature. So he would say, like, if the fact, for example, the fact is that the mother and the calf, they actually are related, and the fact is they actually prosper when they're together, and if they're separated, they both suffer, and the fact that they're suffering means that it's bad, right? I raised the point with, with the co-authors that that's a bit of a difficult conundrum to tackle, because in stoicism, harming an animal per se isn't good nor bad, it depends on the reason that you harm the animal. I know there's people going, what do you mean? But let's imagine that I harm the animal because I want to free it from a nest, uh, from a net. So I have to actually harm the animal in order to remove the, the net that will strangle it eventually. So I'm actually harming it, but the reasons for harming the animal is to free it eventually, right? So then you know, say, so it's the reason behind it. So the fact that the head's in the net is neither good nor bad. 
That's just a fact. So this is the problem that I, I think that Becker, Becker's stance doesn't really solve. Because I say just because a, a calf is separated from its mother doesn't mean that it's good or bad. Why is it separated? And he'll, he'll make the argument that through facts, we can create our values. And then our values then would say what is virtuous or not. And so we argue the problem doing that is that humankind has developed a whole set of values which are contrary to sustainability or environmental well-being. Therefore, those facts that we have, for example, that climate change is, is a problem, then you have the value system which says that, that, let's say the bottom line is money, then we have a complete conflict so that we can't get out, we can't jump over the two degree climate change is a problem or a cow with a net over it is a problem because our values may determine that the reason why the net is on the cow is because we don't want to escape because we value the money that the cow represents. And that's the conundrum we try to set, uh, to sort of look at and say why we think that living according to nature is actually a better uh, framework for which to operate in. So if you say, well, I don't believe in God, I'd say that's absolutely fine. Uh, but think about whatever God means to you as a yardstick. So it, it's not an Abrahamic God. There's no hell. There's no heaven. There's no punishment. It's really much on what you've done to yourself on earth, right? So that's the kind of conundrum that we come to. And we say that, yes, there are environmental facts. For example, that there will be more plastic in the sea than in terms of tons than fish by about 2050. Is that good or bad? Now, people would automatically think, well, that must be bad. If I said the same thing about mosquitoes that carry malaria, I don't I think many people would say, yes, you know what? We need more, <laughs> we need more mos mosquitoes that carry malaria. You see, this again, the fact doesn't change our value. It depends on what we how we perceive that fact or the impression that we have. So that's the kind of delicacy that we try to look at. So yes, there are environmental facts, but the facts per se don't tell us anything. So again, taking a two degree increase, imagine the temperature was 30 degrees colder than it is now, the average temperature, then two degrees increase would be excellent. And we'd be doing everything we can to be burning all the fossil fuels that we have, because we'd say that was essential to our survival. And if we believe our survival is good, if we, can, if we come to that, that conclusion, then we would burn every bit of coal we had on the planet. Problem is that we're actually increasing the temperature that pushes a threshold that is not set, thought to be good for human um, life. Uh, might be excellent for cockroaches, but we don't seem to value cockroaches in the same way. And this again is the fact, um, the ought, and because of the fact uh, conundrum that Steve first mentioned. So what do we do, Kai? Let's say, <clears throat> let's bring it, bring it down to the, let's not talk about the sage here. Let's talk about Steve yeah, yeah, yeah. going, Steve going to Kroger or Walmart, which is even better, right? Um, so, how do I make my choices as a Stoic as to what to put in that shopping cart and what to leave on the shelf? I guess the question would be first: Should you go to Walmart, right? <laughs> well, when you, but yeah, let's, when let's you have, imagine when you have so many, only so many choices, and and depending where you live uh, here, uh, correct, you have to choose what you can. So let's imagine that if this is, let's imagine the only choice is, is Walmart, then for, in that case, stoicism doesn't come into it because you don't have a choice, right? So then, you, then you've, let's imagine you've just read, read the paper and you've read that there's going to be more plastic in the sea than fish. And so you might say, do I know where the fish comes from in Walmart? And the answer might be, no, I don't. And, I could, and then I, you might say, could I get this information or could someone provide it for me? No. Okay, so I don't know where that fish comes from. Should I value fish if I want to live according to nature? And I would say yes. And even if you didn't, I'd say to be just, is it, is it, is it reasonable to buy a fish that you know comes from a, from a source that may or may not be fair to its employees or fair to the environment? The answer I would say would be no. Then I would say perhaps it would be better for you not to buy it. Certain types of fish, for example, you might say, oh, I'll buy tuna, dolphin-friendly tuna. I think we've discussed this before. And the problem with for having that label, only 2% of your actual catch needs to come from dolphin-friendly tuna. <laughs> so 98% of it doesn't come from that, which is why I like Lisa Simpson when she says, well, how much percent of paper of this is recycled? And the lady said, 0%. And she goes, what? She goes, well, zero is a percent. So <laughs> <laughs> I really think the 2% and 0% is a good analogy there. So yes, yeah, so let's imagine you say, okay, I, I don't need to eat fish, but I really feel the need to eat certain protein. And you might ask yourself, do I need 
meat protein. Now, there are some people that I would argue quite strongly do need that and they need to eat meat, say, once a week. And I was like, okay, if you need to eat meat once a week, then, you know, plan your shopping around that need. Because I, I do honestly believe that some people do need a meat intake, you know, once once a week uh, on a say, Friday afternoon. But that then you'd say, okay, I will strip my meat eating to that Friday. I will buy the best quality meat that I know, sort of, I don't know, free range or organic or or so it's certainly been uh, recognized by some animal friendly organization that that meat is is the best meat that you can buy on the market in terms of how it treats the animals and you say well that's more expensive and i say yes but if you're actually only eating meat on a friday for example then you can afford to do that instead of eating meat monday monday to friday where it would be too expensive for you to, to choose such a a lifestyle and then you might argue to me for example you know, if i buy soya which is a typical argument if i buy soya that's in the rainforest and then you know you're all, the, all these vegans out there they're killing the rainforest how terrible see that's why veganism doesn't doesn't work and then i'd say well the fact is that 70 percent of soya is actually for cattle feed so like only 30 percent actually goes to your vegan so to speak and yes that just because you're vegan doesn't mean that your diet is necessarily healthy or or reasonable in terms of the environment so for me for example i make sure that i buy soya that comes from europe particularly or typically i should say italy now the last time i checked there was no rainforest in italy so i'm pretty safe there and it's not much more expensive and it's not something i i buy too often anyway so it is a case of okay what do i need to do if you said to me for example well i can't stop drinking milk in my house because I have a young child. I said, okay, give the milk to your child, but you need to drink it. You see, like, oh, it's easier for me to drink the milk because I've already bought it for my kid. Right. I say, well, okay, then pick something else. Do you need to eat yogurt? And then I say, yeah, but I need to buy my kid the baby yogurt. Like, well, do you eat that yogurt? No. So then just don't buy that yogurt for you. So it's more like looking at what you can do. I would suggest if, if you could eat meat to, to, to use all of it, to waste the least possible, to enjoy it when you eat it and to respect where it comes from, to be aware of those things, to buy locally if you can from a local farmer, to um, certainly raise awareness. And perhaps when you go out to eat, uh, you might say, well, I can't choose so much because the restaurants that I have in my local area are not vegetarian. So I've been in, I've been in Cuba and it's pretty hard there. And occasionally I myself have to eat meat because otherwise in Cuba, you actually would not do so well if you're there for a week. So it's not about having these, these hard and fast rules. It's about going back to principles. So always asking yourself, is this fair? Is this just, you know, do I have the right, you know, do I have time to think about it? Not at the moment. Okay, but what can I do to give myself the time at some point to really think about what I eat? And we make the argument that fast food isn't particularly stoic because you because my uh, Rufus from Sonia's Rufus would say well, that it wasn't really healthy for you. And I would say a lot of fast food is particularly meat burger based. So it's not like stripping away until you're basically in a vegan diet. As, as I said, I think there are certain people that do need a protein intake, but not to have a hyperbolic sort of, oh my gosh, if I don't eat meat, I'm going to die. I mean, that's, <laughs> and I have heard that from a lot of people. I'm going to die if I don't eat meat. I'll be really ill. Well, I'm not saying don't eat it. I'm just saying eat it less. And the same thing with vegans. I've seen vegans who have been, you know, quite unwell. They could have done with the odd egg or two and just been too, like, extreme about it. And said, well, obviously, if you can, if you're healthy without egg, that's fine. But if you feel that you need one or two eggs, what is the problem? Like, you want to be healthy. You want to have a healthy body and a, a functioning mind. So within those sort of boundaries of finances, family commitments, and health and preferences, right? There's some people go, well, I just don't like vegetables. <laughs> I just can't have a diet completely based on vegetables. I, I know a like few it. people like that. Yep. Are they, are they four? Or <laughs> no, no, <laughs> okay. no, unfortunately, no. So it's not about, again, it's not about having a hard and fast rule that you can never break. And although vegans might say that's completely offensive, and I have had that, I, I would I would ask them, okay, if you were in if you were in a desert and you hadn't eaten for a week, you've been, you've been you had enough water but couldn't carry any food, and a Bedouin person comes along and gives you a dry piece of camel meat that's got condiments and stuff, uh, would you would you eat it? I think the answer in most cases would be yes, because the principle is that I want to survive. 
Right. And I, so I, I don't see the see the need necessarily of being very strict on what one eats without going back to to the principle. So a lot of vegans were a bit upset with me because they wanted me to come out and champion a vegan diet, which would be completely insincere and unstoic. But I did say that we should certainly go into that direction because there are nearly 8 billion people on the planet. Most of us live on the coastline and a lot of poor people will die if climate change continues because they will flood, that their land will flood and the European and North American view on it isn't exactly let's welcome all these refugees in. Right. I mean, that's just not the case. People go, oh, well, they won't die, they'll go over to America. I just can't see that happening based on oh, the UK, based on what I know from policy. So, and if you've seen enough disaster films, whenever you have to get into, I don't know, a bunker or something, there's always this sort of free for all into who's going to get into the last <laughs> van or the last, you know, the last plane. So I've not got a lot of faith in our, in our government to allow the entire population of Bangladesh to just get up and move to Texas. So if, if you're one of those people who are like, well, yeah, well, we'll sort that out. Yeah, perhaps look at from policy in various countries and say, perhaps it would be better that we ate reasonably now and so the people in Bangladesh can stay where they are than have to deal with the entire mis displaced population moving to the US and having to deal with those problems because then we'd only have ourselves to blame. Like literally, of course, we'd try to like, politically try to blame somebody else, but as a stoic, it's part of it being honest, right? What's actually going on? So it sounds like to do this well, one, one needs to be fairly well informed. Um, yes. It's hard to be an ignorant stoic, uh, although I guess- you, It's a contradiction, isn't it? <laughs> I guess no matter what, you have to use what knowledge you have to the best of your ability, regardless of the level of that information. But uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I, I was thinking it, uh, we, we need a, a, a stoics field guide to the supermarket here, and we'll, we can rank food according to region on we need a unit like Zenos, like one to ten Zenos on how how. Uh, uh, but that but that book, if you had a book, a field guide, Stoic guide to the supermarket, uh, those numbers would shift depending on where you're standing. Uh, Correct. Like fish, getting fresh fish while I'm standing next to the ocean, let's say, may have a different number of. Uh, a different amount of impact than, than me getting sushi in the middle of a landlocked Arkansas because that had to get here somewhere. So there's levels of complications here uh, depending on right. where we are. So yeah, there is no ranking, which is why Stokes would say that, you know, rank, things like a paleo diet um, to rank things as what was historically made the most sense always makes me smile because people say, well, in the graves you only have bones. Well, yes, because the plants rotted. Like, it's like just not taking these absolutes or I don't have an issue if people want to have a meat based diet, particularly if they have a reason for it. So I have, I have do and aware of people and have met their parents or people who are allergic to plant based material. They can only eat mushrooms and meat mm. and they literally eat like a lion. They eat once a day. So I'm not going to sit there and, and then like rank, according to, you know, everybody's the same. Like we said earlier, there's right. no universal universal diet and it would it would be absolute nonsense for a person standing on a oceanic island to be like no i want soya that would be absolutely contradictory to everything that the Spanish Brutus says about simplicity so there is no there can there can be no field guide so that's the irony of books called how to be a stoic right it's right like, exactly it's kind of it's not it were, before you get into those, it's, it's a really useful book, but as you get into it now, you realize that the title is actually a misnomer. It's, it's not really, how to be a stoic really depends on who you are and where you are. Of course, you could argue that that book was predominantly for the North American market. So yeah, you, you can you can play that to me. But yeah, we don't have a ranking system because it really depends on who you are, how old you are, what your family um, uh, values are for example is it if my friend says to me or my mum says to me oh but i don't like vegetarians and i think they're the they're the most evil person on the planet and i'm sitting in a house it's not particularly stoic for me to have an unnecessary argument <laughs> and so actually in my case i only eat meat normally at my mum's house on a sunday when i'm there and that changed her mind completely because she's like, oh, she always tells people, oh, my son, he returned, but he eats my Sunday dinner. And that actually <laughs> means a lot to her. And she goes around telling her friends that. And so I know that that's really important. And that to me was important value to say, yes, she is part of my circle of concern. 
I don't have to be so rigid that I break a really important relationship to me because when my dad was like trying to get me to eat on other days, she would cross her arms and say, Tim, he only eats on Sundays and he only eats my food. So you can, <laughs> you, you can get other people on your side without being like uh, vicious, right? Not saying, I'm, I look how holy I am because I'm, I'm vegetarian or something. So yeah, there, there is no field guide. It really depends on preferences. So if you offered me meat at your house and you didn't know and you were being very welcoming I wouldn't turn it down if you knew on the other hand and I told you and you were doing it to be mean then I would respond in a different way so it also depends on who you're with what your circumstances are but I tend to say in that paper with the co-authors it's normally about in your house when you're over 18 when you have your own income it's making those choices not when you live with your mom and you don't have those choices or you're you know you're unemployed and you just get whatever you're given that's right. not, stoicism is not so militant in that way where or so restrictive it's more like when you have flexibility when you have and where you have agency use it and uh use common sense right i think stoicism is a common sense approach well we can't have a field guide but i just got word that there is a book coming out called being better stoicism for a world Oh, I'm sorry, Stoicism for a World Worth Living in. There we go. There I go. Yes. Uh, so tell us about <laughs> this book. So it, it is not a film guide. I, we don't tell you. So I should start. Well, this, is, we, this is a project that Leo, Leonidas Kostantikos, so he's my long, well, long time collaborator, I would say. It's been years now. Um, we decided that we were a bit frustrated with only having Silicon Valley Stoicism really you know, in the news and in the New York Times. And we thought maybe we should go back to the principles. So we decided to um, read the stories in great detail of various action stoics and find modern examples, but not necessarily stoics, who showed at least in one aspect of their behavior, a sort of stoic principle. So I'm not claiming that the, the modern uh, examples we use are stoic explained definition i'm just saying that example is a modern useful example to illustrate a principle so every chapter we take a stoic so xeno would be chapter one and we tell xeno story and then we say what we learned from that story but we also have uh some more obscure stoic so we have Pasadonius and we have panitius and we tell their story and we tell Spirus' story. Spirus was the stoic who took um, stoicism to Sparta. And most people think that this, the connection to stoicism and Sparta is because it's a, a macho kind of philosophy. That's not actually true. The connection is that Spirus, Zeno's student, took stoicism to Sparta and taught something important, which I can't tell you what it is, I'll be telling you the chapter. So we basically took each, each story in turn and said why this underlying principle was useful in stoicism. So one of the principles is living according to nature. So there's no field guide because we don't say what one should do. We just highlight the underlying principles and show you what's stake about that. So I'll just give you one example. So we talk about, that is in the book, modern example. We have the example of Pat Tillman that most people who are in the US know, uh, Arizona, Arizona Cardinal, so American football player, who decided not to renew his NFL contract because he wanted to fight in Iraq. We also have the example of Catherine Gunn, who is a British spy who got wind of an internal memo that the NRA had sent to undermine the UN. So one of, the, one of them was pro-war and the other one was anti-war. And we use both their examples as because of their position, that was the, the right thing to do in stoicism. So Pat Tillman, the way that he was a very physical individual and he was a a very patriotic man who really had, you know, held America in high esteem and wanted to do what was right because he didn't want, because they were going to go to war. So he thought that having somebody of good reputation and value was a very useful thing to do indeed. So he should be at war because they were going to go anyway. Catherine Gunn at that specific moment, the British spy, she realizes that if she doesn't do anything, the, there will be an illegal war in Iraq. And so she's stoic in trying to stop it, given the information that she has and given her position, whereas Pat Tillman was never in that position. So that shows that the war itself isn't indifferent. It just depends on your attitude towards that war and your reasons for either being it or not being in it. 
So that was the example that we gave to show that there is a big difference because people often say war is wrong and Stoicism doesn't say that at all. So we gave those two examples to show why, depending on who you are and what you know, war could be right or wrong. So if Catherine Gunn had done nothing, knowing that it was going to allow an illegal war, you'd say that was cowardly. Mm -hmm. You'd say that was a lack of justice. Now, Pat Tillman, who had no way of knowing that information and went to, to support his colleagues because he felt it was the right thing to do and that playing American football was frivolous in comparison, you could say that he was, he was courageous for stepping away from the NFL, uh, from the, the football field. He was self-controlled in that he turned down a lot of money to do what he thought was right. You could say that he had a strong sense of justice that it wasn't fair that American men were, li were laying down their lives whilst he was kicking or kicking or, or catching or tackling something. So you can see in both cases that there's nothing wrong with Pat Tillman's response to the war. Uh, had, he had, had, the, the, had he had the information that Catherine Gunn had, that would be a very different scenario. So I think that kind of shows us again the, the food analogy. So we basically go through a chapter by chapter, un underlining a principle and give an action example and then a modern example and some personal examples as well. There are some examples that I've spoken about here about how I came to Stoicism through my uh, grandmother dying. So that's also talked about and how that helped me reflect on what it means to be better or you know well, what one should prioritize in life. So it really was a response to this whole sort of Silicon Valley stoic, excessive, uh, excessive, uh, what does stoic mean? It was about success and money. And we just, we just sort of gave it a different look about what does success mean and why would money be important anyway? But we, we also talk about very wealthy people because obviously Marcus Aurelius was about as wealthy as you could get. So we also show that money is indifferent and that's why we, we just felt that it just needed to be more balanced. And a lot of female Stoics had said that they did, didn't feel included in this sort of Silicon Valley business-based model because they right. just didn't see it. So we felt that we should write a book that it didn't matter, literally didn't matter who you were. You could find some um, something useful in it because it wasn't particularly targeted to a particular group of people in a particular city or a particular um, ilk, shall we say. And so that comes out in April, it looks like now. In the US, yes. In the US, anyway. Yeah. Uh, um, and then, of course, we should figure out what the most uh, <clears throat> ethical source of, of, of uh, book buying is. Uh, pro uh, probably not Amazon, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because people have asked me that, actually, because that's the only web place that is on pre-order. So then I asked, then I said, it depends, doesn't it? So if you're based where I am, you can't get the book in Portugal. You can't get it in Portuguese. So again, like, I'm not going to tell people where to buy a book because it really depends. And people say, but I only buy on Kindle. If you only buy on Kindle because you think that that's the most environmentally friendly way of doing things, then that's your business. You just, you just have to make your decisions. Like personally, if I was in the UK, I'd prefer to buy in a local bookshop, always. But in Portugal, I don't have that, I don't have right. that luxury of being able to, to buy myself a copy and I will have to buy myself a Kindle copy so that I have an electronic version. Which you, the author never gets an electronic version, doesn't know that. But it, you're supposed to, you know, it's good for you to have a Kindle copy so that you can see what it looks like. So if there's a problem, you can highlight that right. there's an issue with a Kindle version. So you have to buy your own Kindle version anyway. So I will in, be buying one Kindle version. <laughs> so I know I have to buy that from Amazon. But in terms of physical copy, I would uh, highly recommend that you order it from your local bookshop if possible, particularly as. The COVID situation has made that very difficult for smaller bookshops to survive, and also it's it's nice to you know encourage them to you know to buy more and to share in your local area because if it's on Amazon, it's kind of like it's hard to build a sort of community or a book club around that. I would say. Right, right, right. Yeah, I know here in town the <clears throat> the local bookshops philosophy section is. Is a, is a, if you, if you can if you're watching the video it's about you know that big uh, it's got about seven books in it so probably would have to special order that one here in Conway but uh, well they said it wasn't going to be it's not going to be in a philosophy because it's not an academic book ah, at all. So, so where will we find in, it in self help I mean I've been told I've been okay. told because uh, because the the being better is the idea of what ah. can I do to be okay. better what what does that mean and because we make the argument that being better being better at your job in terms of making more money or promotion isn't really what Zigo meant. So make the idea that if you're only being bettered in order to benefit yourself, then you're kind of 
you've kind of lost the idea of stoicism in the first place. I think we just talked about this like two years ago now. So it's about being best for yourself and for the world, which is why it's a world worth living in. So it wouldn't, I mean, I don't know if it would be the philosophy and I'm not the marketer, so I can't tell you, but right. the, the original idea is that it is in the self-help section. Um, it's not aimed at academics, although there are footnotes, there are endnotes and there are footnotes. If people really want to know, for example, uh, where exactly something comes from, we did put it in the footnote, like uh, what was the free maxims linked to the Oracle? So that's in the footnote where it is at the moment. So where did Plato say that? So if you really wanted to check that, I knew my thing and Leo uh, gave me the right information when I saw it at the footnote last night, <laughs> like, you can you can check that. So it is, my idea is that somebody who has no idea what stoicism can look at it, but also somebody even I'm hoping that AA Long would appreciate the effort of the of the footnotes and certainly the endnotes. So there has there is academic parts in it, but that's the endnotes. So if you're really into stoicism, you have that choice. But we were having a discussion with the publisher and like, okay, how do we do it so that you know AA Long or or um, I don't know John Sellers perhaps is more more known across the uh, podcasting world. Uh, how would John would John Sellers get anything out of it? And so the answer what we believe is yes. Would he get uh, as much out of it as somebody who's who's less in, less informed? Probably not. But then what we were hoping he would say, uh, I didn't know about that source. I didn't know about that primary source. You've surprised me. If I get an email from John saying that, I think I've done the job. So <laughs> the the idea was to have sort of three you know different layers. So you can read it very superficially. You can give it to, you know I've been saying to people, you can give it to your partner who hates tourism because she thinks it's pretty selfish. So you, the idea is that you can give it to her and she'll be like, it's still selfish, but less selfish or whatever she thinks. <laughs> uh, but also if you're really into it and you want to know the primary sources, the idea is that that's also available. It is today that could change, but I am fighting for the end notes. So Great. I think it, it needs to be there. Well, we'll look forward to that. If, if, uh, the Sunday Stoic 2.0 exists uh, at that point. We'll have you back on. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if people are also interested, when does it, I don't know when this comes out, but I will be presenting uh, a bit more on the book on 24th of October, a Stoic on X Midwest, I mean, Portuguese for the Brazilian version. So if you are a Portuguese speaker, we'll also be doing it then. Um, so I don't know when it comes out. So if, if you missed it, I, I'm sure Grace Sandler might have a, a recording somewhere. The guy's pretty good at that. I was, you know, I'm open to questions. I can't tell you too much, but I'm open if you have a question about what kind of things it covers. As you know, Steve, I'm always open to emails and Twitter. So, and obviously, I'd love to come back and do this in 2.0. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, Kai, is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with? I, I just think I would like to ask you one question, as it is possibly the last, the last podcast that we do for a while, is. Uh, what has been your favorite memory whilst interviewing or whilst we've interviewed each other, I would say? Is there any memory that sticks out? Well, you're the only uh, interviewee that asks me questions. There you go. I think you're about it. Uh, uh, you'll just say, well, oh, what's your opinion about blah? And, uh, and, mm -hmm. and every time I've interviewed you, you always do that. And, and, uh, uh, Typically, that's not the case with other with other folks. Oh, that's interesting. Well, because you educate me, particularly about I, I love personally for me it was the story you told me about the piranhas, when you said that if piranhas were in a group, they're completely vicious. They're vicious in the non stoic sense. <laughs> they're, 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 they're quite vicious creatures. But you told me that if a piranha was by itself, it gets extremely stressed. And its heart rate climbs. It really thinks it's going to be eaten. And I never knew that. So you've told me a lot about things and taught me a lot about farming because that's why I think also you, I often ask you for advice. I think it would be silly of me. I would be wasting a golden opportunity had I not asked you questions. And also when I talk to you, you help me form an opinion or make me think about things that I've never thought about before. And like I said, to, you know, like I said, oh, I've never thought about that. And I've often said that <laughs> in the podcast. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I'm, I'm not. And one day that, or both of us, neither of us are one of those academics who are like, I'm an academic with letters after my name and I'm always right. I'm like, I'm an academic with letters after my name and they'd be nothing necessarily. <laughs> like, I could be completely wrong. And I think that's the dangerous thing about being an academic that people automatically assume you're right. Right. Really dangerous. Well, <laughs> totally you know right. everything now. You are a PhD, Kai. <laughs> exactly. And that's just nonsense. That's just absolutely <laughs> nonsense. So yeah, I didn't put doctor on. The doctor is not on there. I was like, no, because I think that's a, it's, it can be a false impression. 
Because people can give the word doctor, and for example, Dr. John Sellers is a doctor in, in stoicism, I am not. So I didn't want to put myself on that pedestal, which I should probably fall, fall off. <laughs> I'm waiting for you, Steve, to, 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 to text, email me and say, Kai, you've referenced me and spelled my surname wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm waiting, waiting that, for that kind of stuff. I, I've seen people who are doctors in something completely unrelated to the works that are, they're using, and they do sometimes use that title to give themselves credibility when it shouldn't really apply. Uh, I have seen that many times, especially when folks want to sell you something like, uh, a, 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 a pseudoscientific product, for example, you may see doctor so-and-so says it's great. It's like, well, they're a doctor in history. Why would they know how this pill works? You know, you'll exactly. see that all the time. I've seen it even in stoicism. I've seen state uh, practitioners who have tried to sell a book or two or a course or a weekend away doing the same thing. And then when I've looked up what they're doctor and it isn't stoicism. So I think like, yes, you might pull the wall under somebody's eyes, but I think honesty is always, you know, the best policy on that. And I'd rather people say, well, you're not a philosopher, but oh my gosh, you really know something about philosophy or uh, the philosophy department in, in the university I'm in Belgium, like, what do you mean you're not a philosopher? You think like a philosopher, you write like a philosopher. How is that not possible? And I just say, well, I just didn't do my PhD in that. <laughs> that that's, that's why. So, but that's that's the credibility that I that I want. That people say, no, he hasn't got those three letters, meaning that he's a doctor in philosophy. But if I I am a philosopher, and I have read his work. Like I, I look at like for example what Greg Sander says, and I look at what John John Sander says, and what uh, A. A. Long has told me, and, and Professor Chris Gill, and they have worked with me and have no issue with that. So that's I think that's the best credibility that one can have. Or working with Professor William Stevens is an absolute gem and fantastic and really pulled me up, the same with Professor Gill and Long. They really were like, Kai, what are you doing? So like, they really pull you up and they really educate you. And it's a very humbling experience. And I think if I had put a PhD, I, you know, sort of shiny, shiny on that, it, they would smell it and go, this guy, he's not for real. Why would I lend my expertise or just take all the credit rather than saying, you know, if it wasn't for, for William, for example, the, the beautiful English language that has come out of that, uh, food paper would not, it wouldn't have happened. That was certainly <laughs> Professor Stevens doing that. He's got a way with words and fantastic uh, teacher. And he was really helpful. Well, we should always be thankful for our mentors and those that uh, we surround ourselves that make us better. And we need to uh, go beyond that to think about uh, what's on our dinner plate and where it comes from, right? Indeed. Well, thank you, Steve. It's been fantastic. Thanks for, Thanks for joining the podcast. Once again, still the most uh, frequent guest on the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Love it. Bye, Steve. <laughs> See you, man. Carpe diem.